Thank you guys so much for coming out to the Here We Are podcast. I have not done a live Here We Are since before COVID, so I am so excited about this. Um, how many of you have heard Here We Are before? Yeah, all right. How many of you have not heard Here We Are before? Sweet. Um, thrilled all of you are here. So uh, Here We Are is a, a show. It's, uh, it's very meaningful to me. It happened... Um, 10 years ago, I, I was like a regular, like late night comic. And I just got uh, really, really fascinated by all sorts of, I was always reading science books just as a hobby. And it was always just a side thing. I, I never thought I'd incorporate it in anything. And then, um, I started reaching out to scientists because I, I wanted to maybe figure out how to put comedy and science together and and how to just spread the word about all of these wonderful things that I was learning about. One of the things that I got really fascinated by was uh, was learning a lot about evolution um, because I always, uh, you know, there's early on you just like, oh, there's a deb debate. Either there's creationism or evolution happened. And OK, I believe in evolution. And then that's that. But actually learning about evolution, it's way more fascinating than just like, cool, that's a thing. It tells us a lot about ourselves and why we're here and why we do the things that we do. And I, I thought that it would be really fun to kind of talk a, a little bit about some of the evolutionary underpinnings of play and create creativity and why things like this come together, why us as humans have evolved to do weird crap like this that you don't see as much in, uh, in the animal kingdom. And I have one of my favorite guests. He was on, uh, I first met him in Raleigh uh, years ago when he did. I toured with the show Stand Up Science that blended comedy and science together. He was one of my favorite guests that I had. I've had him on Here We Are a few times since. And so please welcome to the stage from Duke University, Herman Ponser, everybody. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Uh, man, thank you, Shane, for putting this all together. Huh? Isn't this amazing? And uh, I just want to say before we get started, I'm sorry that the queen couldn't make it. And uh, I'm glad I was able to fill in last minute. This is going to be yeah, a Yeah, I had the show. queen booked here, but, but bad news, of bad course. News. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so Herman, tell everyone about your background. I am an evolutionary anthropologist. That means I study how we evolved. And I'm particularly interested in how our bodies kind of came to be the way they are. Uh, you know, if you go back, I like to, to tell classes, you, if you think about it, if you held your, grand, your, your mom's hand and she held her mom's hand, and, you, you know, by the time you got to Chapel Hill, certainly by the time you got to, to Wake Forest, you'd, you'd be, uh, hold, the, the, the hands would have changed, right? The people would have changed, and, and you'd be holding hands with an ape, right, eventually. So you go back far enough, we were all very ape-like about seven million years ago, uh, similar to chimpanzees, and, and now we're like this. And that's weird and interesting, and uh, I'm, I'm curious how that happens and, and, and why. So we study that. What's the weirdest thing about human morphology that kind of surprised you early on? Well, I mean, everything's weird, but it's, here's a fun one. Uh, we don't have a penis bone. Ape, all apes have penis bones, but we don't. We got gypped. Yeah. And the, I mean, obviously, we walk around on two legs. That's kind of weird. We have these huge, bulbous heads. As you guys hang out there, Every fourth breath you take is the oxygen just to feed your brain. That's how expensive your brains are. That's kind of crazy. And it, it doesn't matter even if you're dumb. It still uses a lot of energy. Uh, same amount of energy to be smart or dumb. It's the exact same amount of energy. As far as we can tell, they, they do studies where they get people thinking really hard. Um, and it doesn't, it's like, if you think super hard, they get a, who's doing the games later? This is how they do it. Oh, they get, yeah, we got a board game. They thing get, uh, they, they've done it with chess, and they, you know, if you play a player that's better than you, and with a computer, you can, you can titrate it, right? So you can make sure that the player's always a little bit better than you, and you get these really serious chess players thinking as hard as they can, and at the end of the hour, uh, the, 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 the change in energy from thinking super hard is like one M&M. &M. That's it. Wow. Four calories. So, so tell them about your field work. Yeah, so, uh, you know, human evolution is obviously a really big field, and so the way that I've focused my work 
is on trying to understand how our bodies burn energy because everything in biology is energy, right? So if you want to understand uh, sort of, you know, your brain's using energy, you're walking or, or, or reproduction, reproduction or, or growth, it all is energy. Um, and particularly uh, because we evolved as hunter-gatherers for the past two million years, uh, humans and our ancestors have been hunting and gathering. And so we want to understand what that lifestyle is like and how that affects our bodies and how we burn calories uh, in that kind of a lifestyle. Uh, and so my work is taking me to northern Tanzania to work with hunter-gatherers there, uh, a community called the Hadza, wonderful folks. And so, um, you know, it's not so different. You wake up in the morning in a, in a, in a grass house rather than a tent and uh, go out and, and get food. So you guys are all doing a good job at that as far as I can tell today. Do they have food trucks? No, sadly. Sadly, we uh, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, they would they would dig food trucks. Um, no, they go out. And they, the women gather and the men hunt. It's kind of a you know it's it's a tr traditional society that way. Um, they get a lot of you know it's a lot of physical effort to do all that. So women get like thirteen thousand steps a day on average to go out and get to dig up wild tubers. Who went on the mushroom hunt this morning? Yeah, so you know you're foraging. So it's that kind of thing. Um, they they gather berries. They dig up tubers, that, that's, that's the main thing for food the women are doing. They're also kind of responsible for firewood. Kids usually go get water. Men hunt, you know, hunting and gathering. So men are out hunting with a bow and arrow, uh, and then they hunt everything. It's an intact ecosystem out there, so um, they hunt everything from giraffe to zebra to uh, all the different antelope varieties you've seen in your National Geographic. How much, is, uh, how much of hunting is utility versus kind of advertising? That's a, that's a huge debate. Um, so there's an idea there that if, if all you really wanted to do is bring home calories, then you would focus on the boring animals that are easier to find. Um, and that hunting for really big game to kind of show off is actually counterproductive in terms of calories. Because you're going to go home empty-handed most days, right? There's not a lot of zebra out there, and it's hard to get. But if you come home with a zebra, it's fucking cool, right? <laughs> so it's like the tension. Um, and so I actually, so my buddy Brian Wood, who I do all this work with at the Hadza, uh, he actually delved into that for his thesis. And he says, no, 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 no. Going after big game really does pay off. If you've watched it yet long enough, you haven't needed to let, you know, you need to watch this for like years, which he did. And you look at how often they come home with a big, with big game, it actually pays off. So it's, it's a combination. And obviously, you know, women who are looking for a husband, um, you know, they they it's they they don't have arranged marriages, so it's they're they're marrying for love, or uh, and probably what part of what they love is a guy who's successful, and that means being a good hunter. So and that means hunting big game. Uh, what would you say in in terms of uh, kind of I, I remember talking um, uh, talking to you about uh, like where where men and women kind of vary in the social hierarchy. They're they're in those communities. It's very yeah. balanced. It's right? super flat. Yeah, it's a very egalitarian society, and this is common. So the one thing I'll say, just to, to we're going to talk a lot about hunter gatherers today. I hope it's my fun. I like to talk about that. And so the one thing I'll just say at the start is any any blanket statement you make about hunter gatherers is going to you're going to find some society somewhere that doesn't do it that way because there's a huge amount of variation. Um, we know from historical records and stuff about how people live their lives. But it's pretty common, and it's certainly true with the Hadza, uh, that uh, you know, the social hierarchy is flat. So there's no, you know, there's no chief, there's no president, there's no anybody who's in charge, um, there's no police or anything like that. Um, and, and, and when it comes to men and women, they're on equal footing, right? So, I mean, you, you know, people still try to tell each other what to do, uh, but they don't have, nobody has to listen. And, uh, you know, wives can get divorced from their husbands if they don't like them, men can get divorced from their, you know, it's, it's all very, very equal, uh, which is kind of cool to sort of see in action. How many hunter-gatherer uh, people still exist in the world? Communities like that, in, you know, sort of still thriving? I mean, probably less than, probably less than 10. I'd say fewer than ten, and uh, and probably most of them in South America. There's some unco un uncontacted groups in the Amazon, but folks like the Hads are really, yeah. I mean, most of, there's been so much pressure, like in the states here too. But, but um, there's been so much pressure to move these these groups into towns and villages and settle them because the governments don't like people that that don't have you know they don't sort of understand their authority and and fit into the economic system. Um, so. How many is in the kind of group that you study? Uh, there's only about a thousand folks that would consider themselves hot, so maybe 1,500, and of them, maybe half or maybe 
three quarters are still like hunting and gathering. Like if you went there right now, you could go to a camp and there would be five or six grass houses around and they would be up and hunting and gathering every day. And probably, you know, so probably a few hundred that are still doing it. Not, not many, not wow. many. Is yeah. that, does that like make you sad when you see Super that? Or does sad. It... No, of course, of course. I mean, uh, and I think it's inevitable. Um, we, you know, we, we, I say we, the researchers I work with, uh, we try to help out their community. We've set up a, a charity to try to help, you know, support like medical needs for them and stuff to keep their community strong and work with them. But I think it's inevitable. I mean, you know, I, I think in, uh, I don't even want to put a time on it, but there will be a time and I'll probably be alive for it that they won't be hunting and gathering anymore. What, what's their reaction when scientists first start showing up? <laughs> I know it's been, it's been happening for yeah. some time now. But. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing you know when you go out to that part of any, yeah, anywhere I've ever traveled, you know, humans are not ever isolated, really. There's no such thing as an isolated group, I don't think. So they are always bumping up against other tribes uh, in that part of Tanzania. There are at least three other tribes uh, that kind of have their own cultures and their own way of life that they'll see every day. Uh, you know, Europeans have been going through that part of the world for centuries now. So um, I'm not sure that it would be too strange, but, uh, you know, anthropologists like me have been working with them for decades now. Uh, you know, we, we, laugh, we joke that not, not only are Hadza textbook hunter-gatherers, they are actually are the hunter-gatherers in your textbook, right? They are really, they, they've been studied a lot. Uh, and so, so yeah, they're, they're, they're cool with it. Um, and the, the guy who I work with most, Brian Wood, they love, they like named their kids after him. So, um, so you were, it's like rolling up with, you know, Mick Jagger when you are <laughs> going up with, with Brian. Very cool. So I, I have, I, I kind of know a direction that I'm going to take this conversation, but, but, um, just since we're doing it live and uh, we, we have such a communal vibe here, uh, does anyone have a, a question so far just about like the Hods or something you'd like to know? Yeah, Jeff. Hi, so I'm a psychologist and the big question is always about progress. Have humans been making progress? And so one way to ask this question is to say, would I rather be born in the year that I was, 1973, or 1873, or 1773? And I always end up saying 1973. But you, as someone who studied the Hazda, uh, would, would you rather be born as one of them or as one of us? That's an interesting question. Would I rather be born like me or like them? Um, there's a couple ways to answer that question. If I wanted to, I could I could have moved there. So I guess you know my answer, right? I mean, whether whatever I whatever I answer you with, my revealed preference is that obviously I prefer to be here. Um, but you know, by the numbers, uh, I am a big fan of medicine and sanitation uh, and and good food. Um, and so I, I love living. I, I think I think here is on most counts better, but a couple things. There's, a, there's caveats, right? Um, all the stuff that we're all gonna die from, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity-related diseases, they don't get, right? So they've already kind of figured that out, uh, and we haven't, so I wish we could learn from them for that. The egalitarian piece, I wish we could learn from them for that. Uh, and so there are pieces that I would love to bring back, and, you know, and, and for that matter, there are pieces of our culture that we bring to them. When we bring, when we go there, we, we bring medicine, we bring that kind of stuff because, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, we don't want to exoticize them and, and make them others. We're, we're, we're partners in this work. So, um, so it's a two way street, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I would pick here. I have a, I have a related question. So a, a lot has happened in our evolutionary history yeah. and, and in this sliver of time that, you know, most of the history that we learn about goes back, you know, 10,000 years or something right. tops, which is nothing in evolutionary time. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you were going to be born and you had to be a hunter-gatherer, would you rather be a hunter-gatherer back when everyone was a hunter-gatherer or a hunter-gatherer today where also you get some medicine and interventions and stuff like that? Right. Well, that's an easy one. I would rather be born about 20,000 years ago because you have all the big animals around. Um, and so, and, and it's less of the world has been turned into farmland and cities. And so there's just more options for you to live as a hunter-gatherer and there's more good ecosystems to be part of. Um, and so that's, I, I would pick that. And so here's another fun one. When you think about like, what would you rather 
do. If you ask people how happy they are, that's one way of asking this question, right? Because who cares if you live a long time if you're grumpy? Um, and uh, That's a question I've asked myself many, many times. Yes, yes. Uh, and so if you ask people how happy they are across culturally, um, the odds are as happy as anybody. Now, I mean, of course, what do they mean by they say happy, that kind of thing. So there's some sort of cultural relevance to those questions that we can interrogate. But uh, in general, they're as happy as we are. So I guess it doesn't matter is the answer. And, and the, the reverse, though, is true. I know from past conversations that that when it comes to being born Hadza, a lot of people that then start moving into city life end up not liking it and moving back. Yeah, I mean, there's a big, all the stuff you learn that you don't even know you're learning, you know, from age zero till your teenage years, it just kind of really sets you in a culture. And it's, it is hard to move cultures. And, and they don't, you know, so for them to kind of try to fit into city life is hard. But also, yeah, I don't think they have as much fun, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of fun, which I, I, I would, as we kind of get into the evolution of fun and play and yes. why in the world things like this happen, um, what, what percentage of a day, this must vary dramatically with the uh, seasons and everything else, yeah. but what percentage of the day is, uh, like what, what's a work week look like for a Hadza? Like how many hours of ah. uh, like utility, hunting yeah. and gathering type stuff is happening? We just did this, uh, we kind of rounded up about 20 years of data on this to have a really close look at it. Uh, they're clocking like, mm, it's, it is really variable, something like a 30 to 40 hour work week actually, it's not so different than us. Yeah. Well, so we've made so much progress. Yeah. yeah, but they're out walking, you know, so maybe that's better. Um, and, uh, it, but, but so there's so much downtime and there's no, you know, they're not like, checking emails and shit like that. So there, uh, there's a lot of like hanging out communal time that I, yeah, I think is just, we'd call it fun, you know, it's fun for them. They're like chatting away, hanging I mean, out. I mean, you, you would think that with all of the technology that we have, you yeah. would think we would have a bit more down to, like, isn't it sort of the point of getting all of these efficiencies yeah. and everything else that we would have downtime, but there's a lot of competing. Yeah. We, have, we have dense populations, and then we have like sexual selection pressures and status pressures. And so we're, we're, a lot of people are working 60 hours a week. I know. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a paradox in, econ in, in economics that's well known. It's um, if you make things easier, people will find a way to make it, to fill up that space and make it harder again. So, you know, you put, give everybody seat belts and they still find a way to drive faster and, and have car accidents. You give everybody, you know, safety at work and they still will push that until they're having accidents at work. Um, you, you make productivity, you, you make it so, you know, you give people laptops instead of typewriters and they can get their work done in six hours, but they still stay, stay eight hours and do the, you know. So it's just this, it's this uh, runaway Race, it's they, they call it the red queen. The, the evolutionary version of this is the red queen scenario, right? Where you're always running just to stay in place because if everybody's running, then I can't ever stop, right? And so if all species are kind of moving forward evolutionarily, not really progress, but they're changing over time, then I have to keep changing too. I can't ever stop. We're always being graded on the curve. So it's, yeah. it's like when I was in school, I always tried to find like the kids that always got the A pluses and be like, hey, can you? Yeah. Just settle down a little That's bit. Right. Well, you should you'll, the, the you'll other way still to do get it. the A plus and then you could also just hang out with in the dumb classes. They make <laughs> them. True. I think they still make do they still make they must they must still make them. I'm sure. Yeah. Um so what what sort of I mean I, you can approach this any way that you like because there's all sorts of play throughout our lives just from what we do with a little bit of downtime and and even at work we you know have laughs and things like that and then yeah. going to having you know, small social gathering all the way up to having big ritualistic uh, things where lots more people get together. Yeah. Um, what what sort of uh, what sort of stuff are the Hansa getting into? Yeah. So uh, they, you know, the, there's a lot of like just social hanging out, laughing and telling stories. Storytelling is a huge thing, right? Narrative and, and telling old stories or telling about what happened today. And they're wonderful storytellers. They just crack each other up all the time. Um, so a lot of it's that. They, they like to gamble. So they'll, uh, they, the guys I know will have like, you know, arrow shooting competitions, um, archery competitions, 
and gamble. They actually, they typically gamble their arrows. They make their own arrows. So that's a lot of work in each arrow. So they'll gamble their own arrows. Uh, that's fun. Um, I don't, I, you know, the women, I'm not sure if they gamble as much. I haven't seen it. Maybe I just missed it. Uh, and then they, then the, the big thing that they have sort of that brings them all together is they have these big Apeme festivals. Uh, and they will, uh, you know, it's, it's at nighttime and it's often full moon or sometimes it's when there's no moon. It's, they kind of have two different ways of doing it. If they want pitch black or if they want to be able to sort of see. And, um, and it's a lot of singing and, and celebration. And that might be, they do those seasonally uh, based on what the moon's doing. They do it uh, for personal events like a marriage. Uh, and so... They have these big festivals as well. I don't know if you call it a festival, but um, a big, big parties. And like, do you get to take part in their? Yeah, you don't. You don't have to. Or do they make you like yeah, sit in the no, corner with a notepad? Or? So, <laughs> so, um, so the way it works is, when we're doing field work there, we set up our camps. We live in tents and stuff, uh, kind of bes you know, to the side, about you know, maybe a hundred yards away, hundred feet away, maybe let's say not hundred yards uh, from there where their camp is. Um, and the idea, the reason for that is, you know, you're already in their business all the time. And if they're super generous and hospitable, they let, they're happy to have you there. But, you know, you want to give each other a break. And so uh, nighttime is when we usually kind of back off and, and make sure we're not in their hair. Um, and that's when the festivals happen. So you can, I've been in a lot of camps where you can hear them happening. Um, but they, a lot of them have a religious element to it and to sort of just, you know, be the tall, awkward white guy walking into a party. I've already done that enough here. I don't need to do that there, you know? So, um, so I haven't done a whole lot of participation because, yeah, you know, I just want to be respectful of, the, of, the, of their, what they're doing. So there's a lot of uh, the religions tied in pretty heavily. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is going kind of hand in hand with the storytelling, really. Yeah, and, and it, it's all tied up. And I think if you asked a Hadza guy to sort of make those separations, what's religion, what's culture, what's fun, what's social, it wouldn't have a lot of meaning, you know? Um, these are all distinctions we make ourselves. They don't, I mean, this is a culture that doesn't have days of the week, right? Really? Yeah, no, that doesn't, you know, if you say, like, I'll be there Wednesday, they'll be like, oh, that's awesome. You come on Wednesday, whenever that is. Uh, when you go to a Hadza camp and you ask somebody how old they are, they go, you tell me. They, they have no idea, they don't, they don't care. Um, I, they, I mean, they, they understand that people grow up and grow old and go through puberty and all that kind of stuff, but uh, Hadza moms, typically don't know how old their kids are to more with, you know, like they can ballpark it, but that's about it. So they, they don't, if you ask a Hadza guy, what's he going to do today? We've tried this. Are you going to go hunting today or are you going to go gather honey? Honey is another thing that guys do a lot. And they'll be like, well, yeah. And they kind of read you like, I, I'm going to go hunting, you know, <laughs> uh, or I'm going to go get honey, uh, you know, and they're like, oh, I don't care what you do. I'm just curious. And if they just don't, you know, it's a very different cultural take on organ how you organize. Like, can we just admit that we had a? Can we just acknowledge that I had a bug land on my junk. I don't want to be the only one who saw that. Um, you weren't. Good, good. That was like a, a Mike Pence moment, but weirder. Uh, anyhow, so you know, it's just the way that we divide up our world. We, we and this is what I love about anthropology. Um, we take it for granted that you have days of the week. We take it for granted that you know how old you are and that, you know, there are these cultural roles and gender roles. We, all that stuff is taken for granted. And, and um, cultural anthropology kind of blows that up and says, take nothing for granted. Evolutionary biology blows it up as well and says, you think it's normal to be like, to live 70 years and, you know, not, you're not an adult till you're a teenager. By the time, so most mammals, our body size, uh, by the time you're six years old, you'd be a grandparent or dead, right? I mean, this really long, protected lives we had, walking around on two legs, big brains, like this, that's all super weird. So you take nothing for granted. I love that about what I get to do. Mm. Uh, this is a good time to maybe get at another question. Yeah. Are there people that are full-time entertainers in Hatsa culture, or is it just not enough time to have that level of specialization? Like, are there people that, like, you don't need to gather. We got you because you're such an awesome entertainer. Right. But, but can I repeat as so everyone can hear? So he, he's asking if there's like professional entertainers within the Hadza where like 
uh, that's what they do. They they they're really good at yeah. juggling or whatever else. So everyone else is like, "We'll get the food for you. You just keep on juggling and singing." Is this concern for Shane? What he would do? Uh, no, Shane would have to get a job. He would have oh. to. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Because everybody's busy. That's a funny thing to think about. So in our culture today, anybody want to guess how many? What percentage of Americans are in the food production business? actually put the food, make the food, or grow the food that ends up on your plate? Anybody want to take a guess? Zero would be a bad guess because you're eating something. But that's an interesting guess. It didn't just appear. Somebody made it. 20%, 10%? 20%. It's two said two. It's you. You're right, sir. Hold on a second. Hold on. I have something. Hold on. For having the best answer out of all those submitted, um, do you speak Polish? Oh, well, never mind then. Hold on. <laughs> Does anyone here speak Polish by chance? Do you read Polish? No, I just have a few words in French. Well, if you want, there's the... a Polish version of Herman's book. I wrote a book. You'll know a couple of the words. And you, sir, come on up for, for getting the best answer. Right. There you go. Of course, of course. And uh, if you learn Polish, you can have the Polish version of the book. I have it here, too. Um, I'll get it to you after the thing. Anyway, 2%. So, it's, so how is it, you know, think about that. Uh, the reason that works is we pour all sorts of fossil fuel energy into making food, right? So we don't have to spend our own energy to do it. Uh, but it also means that we have all this free time, uh, and, and like not just free time in our own lives, but people who have no jobs making food, and if you don't have to make food, you can do anything. And probably, I don't know how many of you, raise your hand if you are in food production, not like in a restaurant, but like actually making food out of the ground or something like that. A couple, a couple. So, but that's about right. So there's probably a hundred of you here and you know, one or two raise your hand. Uh, the rest of us have jobs that don't involve that and we are freed up to do that because we live in a society where we can make, it take, you know, two people out of a hundred can make all the food for everybody else. In Hadza culture, that doesn't work. In Hadza culture, everybody's a hunter-gatherer, hunter or gatherer. Uh, and so there are no, there's no entertainers. There are shamans that come through. This is interesting. They have like uh, medicine men they're always men, but they're never from the Hadza community. They're never from the Hadza tribe. They have like other tribal people from other neighboring tribes for whatever reason, that's kind of their, dig, their, their gig. And you could think of them as, I mean, they're spiritual leaders, so maybe it's mean to call them entertainers, but that's, it's that kind of a non-food production job. That's the, only, that's the closest thing I can think to that. Well, I'll ask the question for the few of you that now want to know. Tell us about that. The medi what, what are the medicine workers? Yeah, so uh, I, this is an interesting thing. I'll tell a, a short story, which is uh, we had a, a baby in, well, it wasn't a baby, one or two-year-old kid uh, in a camp I was working in who we think had malaria, and that kills children all over Africa and other parts of the world that have malaria all the time. It's a really, it's a, it's, you know, mosquitoes are the da most dangerous animal in the world. Uh, and so we took that child to, uh, to a clinic, and we got it medicine, got him medicine, came back, and, but he didn't like the medicine, right? Because they don't make like child, like berry-flavored anti-malarials. Like you, you get what you get, kid, and, and so the parents are trying to give them the, kid the medicine, the kid's crying. The shaman comes in, and uh, so he just happened to be there. They're not always there, but he happened to be there, and he said, don't worry about it, mom and dad. I'll just gonna roll some dice and smoke some leaves in a fire and, and you're good. And then he made up some like just very sweet tasting honey and water as far as I could tell that's what it was uh, for the kid and there's your medicine. And the parents were like, we like that guy better. We're gonna do that. And so thankfully the kid survived. Um, but that's what they do, they, they sweep through, they answer people's questions for them, they tell their futures. I had my future read, um, I don't remember what he said. I don't think he pictured this exactly. Uh, but, you know, and, and they give medicine out, which, uh, who knows what the effectiveness of it is. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, I, I was talking with, ah, I wish I could remember one of my guests that lives with uh, some other hunter-gatherer people, I can't remember where, but they have a lot of, um, they have witches yeah. there that, do, that serve as, as doctors, and it's a lot of, it's really interesting because they get, they get close, they're like picking up on yeah. something going on, uh, so they'll, they'll get, um, They'll get some bacterial thing from uh, from drinking bad water, and they're clearly picking up on that it's related to the water because they go like oh, this water monster came yeah. in in the middle of the night and put a curse on us, and so the witch comes in and usually says, 
like, well, it's because you weren't being generous enough with the community and right. the way that you want to make that right is like, give out, be more generous with any, get rest, do these things, a, a few spells or whatever, a ritual. Yeah. And then, um, and then that's it. But the placebo effect is no joke. Yeah. And, and the truth is that, you know, a lot of kids, most kids survive, right? Most anybody survives most things, right? So like you get better. It isn't that great. And the placebo effect is big. Um, but this is an issue, you know, before we have medicine, all cultures everywhere are trying to figure out what the hell's going on. They don't know about germs. They don't know about stuff. They, they get an idea. They're smart. People are smart everywhere. Um, but, you know, like the Bible's full of this stuff. The book of Leviticus is like basically uh, how, to, how to stay healthy if you are living in cities, which are kind of a new thing at the time in the Bronze Age, and uh, trying not to die from drinking each other's tainted water. You know, it's, it's like it's all all of that's in that baked into these old cultures. And even now today uh, in the traditional cultures of trying to stay healthy. Um, I will just keep on talking if I don't let you guys ask questions uh, in the back. first. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm wondering if you've spoken to them about any historically accurate, at least by Western standards, their oral tradition that is you know corroborated you know like okay we do have this oral history of the rift opening up you know near there anything like that uh no they 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 don't they have um so when we go there we often like to to have movie night for fun so we'll have them all they all gather around the research camp and we put uh the question was sorry the question was do they have oral histories that we can pin to actual historical events or or, or past events and I'm going to get there in a second. But this, uh, they, uh, we like to, to have movie night because they dig that. And they don't speak English. We speak with, we, we communicate in Swahili when we're there. Uh, and they, they are all bilingual. They speak Hadza and Swahili. Um, but so, you know, you can't really show, like, the notebook or something like that. That wouldn't go over really huge with the Hadza camp. But they love action movies because it's just fun. Um, and so we were, a big one when it was new was uh, the Jurassic Park films familiar with that and uh, they show a lot of dinosaurs if you don't know it's a dinosaur movie and um, they love that and I mean can you imagine being a hunter-gatherer yeah. and then someone shows up and shows yeah. you Jurassic Park yeah oh they love it and they love it when the people get eaten they're like fuck yeah that's amazing <laughs> and they get I mean they, they, it's not like they get that it's fake but they also I mean anybody watching it, it looks amazing and um, but uh, the guys afterwards are saying like, ah, oh, yeah, that's just like the story we have where, you know, way back in the before times, the way that everything got started were these big monsters that were fighting and they have, you know, so they, they have a, their, his, their history is more fantastical like that is the connection I'm, I'm drawing with that story of the Jurassic Park. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know that there are cultures. I mean, the reason you probably asked the question is there are great examples of that being the case. Uh, Australian cultures that have these oral histories where the sea level has changed and they, they have histories where, oh, there, there's an island there that the swall was swallowed by the sea. And it's surely that's, that's exactly right. So um, no examples of that with the Hadza culture, but, but there are examples of that uh, globally. Well, there's so there's so much more going on with humans and um, communication and and cultural transmission and stuff than than just trying to um, uh, trying to archive some yeah. accurate. You mentioned storytelling, such a huge part of it, and the best storyteller is probably embellishing <laughs> a few things here and there, and you can imagine that just building over time. It's interesting, right? I mean, we call it, it's the Here We Are podcast. People really want to know why they're here, how we got, like, as everybody wants to know that. And the story you tell about it um, means a lot to you personally about it. And, uh, and so every culture has that story, right? It's, it's interesting. You, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I was kind of maybe building on that. I mean, do you have, you know, I think about the game Telephone, you know, where just like one phrase will get so convoluted just with like 10 people. So, I mean, is there any... Have, have people thought about how could stories potentially maintain some level of veracity for thousands of years? It just seems right. it seems so difficult to to believe, and yet there there it is. Yeah, how do oral histories, how do stories maintain a kind of coherent a coherence or be truthful to the original over time? 
I mean, maybe they don't. Yeah. Do we know that they do? I don't Seems know. Seems impossible. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah but, but you were saying about, you know, that they're still talking about like an island, you know, I mean, things, which, things like that. Which makes examples like that. I mean, for every example like that, we could probably find a thousand stories that have changed or whatever or disappeared or came back. So, so that's why the story examples like that are so incredible uh, where you actually have, you can actually pin it to a historical thing that it's, there seems to be some truth to it. Um, and, you know, I, I think, too, like, what you know, humans, we live, we, we call it a, a dual inheritance in anthropology. Um, we have this, the genes that we've inherited, and that's why we're all human shaped. Um, but we also have this cultural inheritance that we all have. So, you know, think about this. There is no, there's no gene for fire, right? And yet we've been living with fire for a million years to the point that our dig digestive systems actually require cooked food. If you try to live on a raw food diet, um, it's, it's a challenge to get enough nutrition, and that's even, you can do it just about today if you can shop at a supermarket and eat domesticated foods, but to eat a raw food diet on undomesticated foods, I would wager is actually nutritionally impossible because our guts just don't have, we don't have these big pot belly guts like other apes do to, to get, to suck all the energy out of the food. Um, and so, you know, there's an ex example, we, our genes are built to expect this cultural adaptation of fire. Uh, we all are all able to have spoken language here, or else you must be wondering what's going on. Um, so, but we don't, you come into the world with a brain that's ready to learn language, but not, the language isn't, isn't loaded, right? So you got to have a childhood that, that teaches you that. The people that we work with, the Hods, and, and but actually all of us, you're born not knowing how to make a living. Isn't that crazy? Every other species you can think of, I bet, grow, you know, is born and immediately knows what to eat whether that's mother's milk or whether that's whatever. And even as adults, when they, you know, if they, if they are mammals, they are nursing with it. When they graduate to being self-sufficient, they don't have to be told to eat grass. They know to eat grass. We don't know how any of that works. We have to be taught. And we're not any good at it until we're in our teenage years. That's crazy, right? So, so everything from reproduction to language to food, it's all this dual inheritance. Our culture is just as important as our biology. Now, if you want to keep a piece of culture that is going to stay true for a long, long time, it can either be really important like fire, and then you don't fuck that up because you don't want to die, or you can, especially if you want to kind of have control around it, you make it, you make there be cultural penalties if you get it wrong. So you have to remember the story that I'm telling you, and this is the religion that we're going to have. You want to call it religion, you want to call it a shared culture. And if you don't tell the story when it's your turn and you don't tell it right, there's penalties for that, either social or maybe there's real penalties for that. Uh, so that's the other way that humans do. We're always policing each other. And that's actually, that self-policing is really important um, in a culture like the Hadza where there's no, there's no hierarchy, right? So we all self-police all the time. You guys, we're up there camping this morning and we're all nice to each other, even though you don't know each other. Uh, and the person who is kind of not super nice, everybody kind of knows. It's like that, you know, watch out, ten, that orange tent's a jerk, you know? And we're all doing this all the time. We have to. We have to self-police because we're actually not built. That, that, that's, that's how we usually keep things normal and, and, and running in a human society. Because it's culture or it, the cultural blanket we're all wearing is as important as the biology. So people can actually live without a president? How do yeah. they know what to do? Well, we did it for four years. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that was easy. That was too easy. Um, the, <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, right? It, but, you know, so there are funny things about that. Like right now, in, you know, for the Hadza specifically, there's all this cultural pressure and, and government pressure for them to kind of like, you know, they, they're, they're passing laws that restrict land use in that area. And, they would, and the government is trying to be good about it, I'll say, and they want to have a, a Hadza representative at the table to say, this is what the Hadza want. Well, they don't have anybody who can be at the table, not really. They started to do that. They started to elect people who can be their representatives, but that's a strange concept to them because there has never been historically or culturally. Nobody's allowed to speak for everybody else. That's not how it works. So it actually, you know, to their detriment almost is, is, in these, these days. So the thing that really fascinates me um, that I, that I want to get into, and we're, we're already just, uh, yeah, this is great. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to um, address this sort of, 
seeming uh, seeming paradox yeah. that that there is about uh, you know uh, this idea of survival of the fittest, which I know is sort of a misunderstanding, but but, yeah. but popularly and most people have heard that phrase and kind of think about evolution in that way. And so you're hunting and gathering, and that's how you're sustaining, and you're battling, and you're running from predators, and and trying to get prey, and all these different things. Yeah. Why in the world? waste a bunch of energy with yeah. dancing or painting or yeah. even even storytelling yeah yeah uh, it's a great question and i think it really gets at how we kind of often misunderstand how evolution works right so you know i study energetics i study metabolism that book is all about how our bodies burn energy and i'm happy to i could go on that forever so i won't um but you know we often think about oh gosh how would you get enough energy out of this ecosystem or how do you get enough food to survive and and if you don't make your own food, that seems like a really scary prospect. I think this is kind of a, a, a question born out of ignorance and fear, like, oh my gosh, if I had to make my own food, I couldn't do it. Um, but if you grow up doing that, then you realize that actually humans are so clever uh, and so good at getting food out of our, of our environments that we actually can get more than we need easily all the time. And that's actually important for the way that humans work. So the reason that we have these long childhoods that take so long to grow up and be productive is we have to learn these complicated ways to make a living. It's still true in the States that we're just learning different complicated ways to make livings, like to be a professor or something like that, uh, or be a comedian. It takes a long time. Um, but anyway, it's true for the Hadza too. But why, when you get to be a, a, an adult and you can do it, you can get so much food that you can give it away. And so they do. They, they get more food that they need, and they give it to the kids that are learning how to do it. And that's the cycle, right? That's the, that's the cycle. But what that means, to have that work, you have to be so good at getting enough food that you can get twice as, as much as you need. And then when in that case, now, energy actually isn't a limiting thing anymore. Now we can play, right? And so, you know, I was thinking about your, the, when you asked me to be part of this, uh, you were saying, well, let's talk about the evolution of festivals. And I thought, well, what, what do you need to have a festival? And you need a lot of things, but um, you need at least three. You need a lot of people you need that are, that are happy to be social together. Um, you need time, uh, and you need creativity, right? I think that's fair. And so, you know, that hunting and gathering gives you all those things. Uh, hunting and gathering, it's, it's not hunting or gathering. It's, it's the and part of hunting and gathering that makes it so successful that we share food. Because if you go out hunting and come back empty-handed, I share with you what I've gathered. And if I come home from hunting with a big game, I share with you that. And it's the sharing and the sociality that makes humans so incredibly successful that there's 7 billion of us on the planet today. Uh, but, but that it also puts an evolutionary premium on, on being social, having big groups, having a place that we're going to call home, right? Because to, to share, we also have to agree that we're going to come back to the same place to share, right? So hunting and gathering gives you the social part. The fact that it's so successful and I can go out and I can get 6,000 calories in a morning means that I have time. I have time. So I'm, I have sociality. I have time because I'm not spending 12 hours getting my food. And then you need creativity. And hunting and gathering is a hard, sophisticated way to make a living. And so for the last 2 million years, our brains have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Our brains are three times the size of an ape's brain. And almost all of that increase happened in hunting and gathering, within the context of hunting and gathering over the past two million years. And you can watch brain size go up at the same time you see cultural sophistication go up, the tools get more complex, right? So all those three things that, that are just critical for festivals all kind of happen with that. Uh, was that around the yeah. advent of fire? Do, 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 uh, uh, Fires I, I know some people speculate that that's... Fire, that's yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big question about when exactly fire gets started. Fire is an early arrival, but not at the very beginning, I don't think. Um, all right, uh, we have another question. Yeah. Can you speak to how it's changed you to study tribes like these? Can he speak to what? <clears throat> uh, how it's changed him to study tribes like these. Oh, that's a good question. How, how has it changed you to your field work? Well, I think the biggest change, this is true with any travel that you get to do, especially international travel, is just to get a whole other look into the way that another culture runs their, runs their lives. <clears throat> Scar, yeah, oh, hold on, can up. we get another water up here? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I just have a... No, I don't want your water. You know about COVID, right? It's a thing. 
you, you live with hunter-gatherer people. You That's true. That's true. Uh, it's, that is cleaner than we usually drink. Um, <clears throat> I'm feeling better now. Thank you. Uh, to have it, I, I think it has pushed me to chill out more, and the fact that they don't have a calendar that they're, they're glued to, that's been the, my biggest eye-opener. Um, because I am from, you know, my upbringing was very, you know, work ethic, German Catholic, uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but I think it does. You're, you know, guilty until proven innocent. Isn't that the Catholic way? I think that's true. I was raised Catholic. Uh, yeah. and I didn't hear any of it. I didn't pay attention to it. No, anything. fair enough. But you just absorb the fact that you should always be working, you should always be doing something, and everything, should, you know, that was the way I grew up anyway. Whether I, if, whether I can blame my upbringing on that or not, but that's what I absorbed. And to just un, you know, loosen that a little bit and kind of get a broader perspective has probably been the biggest take home for me. That is a great question. It's, and, and any travel, you know, uh, it just you just absorb stuff. So I can't even point to one little thing. You know, but yeah, thanks. So I guess first I need a little bit of clarity in, in terms of, so this thousand people, they're all living together or are they, in, is it like 50 people towns or? Cause I, what, where I'm going with this is, if they're having a festival and they don't have calendars and things, I, I guess they just they just know what day the moon's going to be, f or what, <laughs> sorry, not days, what yeah. time the, yeah. the moon's yeah. going to be full, and you say full moon is the next party? Yeah, there's that, and uh, you know, the, the so the way that they are arranged, they live in camps of maybe five to 15 houses, grass houses, and each one of those houses will be you know, mom and dad and kids, or maybe grandma and grandpa. It's, you know, it's, it's a typical assortment of folks, kind of, it's not so different than here, actually. Um, and, yeah, but they're not all in one place. And so when they want to gather in one place, they kind of send out word. And it's just, it, what's amazing in those contexts is how quickly word spreads. Because if you go out and, you know, if you're going to go out and walk, you know, 10 miles to go get food, you're probably going to run into other guys who are also running, walking their 10 miles to get food. And of course, you know, you're always, nobody's ever anti-social. You're always like catching up and chatting and, uh, oh, we're going to have this thing tonight and, you know, or tomorrow or whatever. And so uh, that, I think that's how word gets out. But you bring up an interesting point, which is if you're kind of spread out in a hunter-gatherer, how do you have big festivals? And the answer is you build them, right? You build stuff like this and you tell everybody you're, you're going to come. And there's actually a really great archaeology of that. Neanderthals were building these big cave sites with the, the stalactites broken off and rearranged in big circles. Uh, you can think of the cave painting sites, which are you know the famous ones in Europe or in, in Indonesia as well, actually, which are 50, 60,000 years old. Those are all hunting and gathering groups, and those are clearly festival of some kind of, of sites. Um, there's a great site called Poverty Point. <clears throat> Anybody here been to Poverty Point? It's in, in Louisiana. You should go. It was built by hunter-gatherers here uh, in, in North America about 10,000 years ago. It's about as old as Stonehenge. And it's built like Burning Man. Who's been to Burning Man? Of course, obviously. Right, which is this sort of big semicircle around a, a stage, as I understand it. Uh, and, it. and it's actually built the same way, Poverty Point. And, so, and, and you, people weren't living there, or not all the time. It was, this was a collection, a festival place, yeah. Um, does, yeah. Do any of these um, cultures feel the need to, I don't know, adopt animal husbandry or farming and decide, you know, maybe there's a better way than just walking through the woods all the time? Yeah, uh, they dabble a little bit in it sometimes. I mean, you know, it, you know this, the, what's this movie? I see the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy. Anybody seen that one? And it's again, it's this idea, this myth of an isolated culture. And that actually is based on the, the San culture in Botswana. They're, they're, a real, they're a real culture, like the Hadza, they're hunting and gathering. Not anymore. They've been moved to, sit, to villages. But, um, you know, that's not how the world works, right? They know about farming, and they know about vehicles, and they know about cities. Uh, and the fact that they don't do it is because it just doesn't really appeal, right? Because if you are a farmer, Oh shit! Then you have to then you have to plow the field and you have to plant the stuff. You have to get the water. It's a very dry dry habitat. Uh, if you live with animals, that's you know you are living with animals. You are you're knee deep in it. You know, and there's disadvantages there. Uh, and so it's not as appealing as maybe it would sound to them. They really value the idea that they live it kind of simple and easy. 
They can just do whatever they want. Freedom is a really big value, you can tell, watching these guys, and so and women too. And so, yeah, you don't see, they, they know about it, and some will dabble, but they don't do much. So I remember my question. It's about, we did, on Mind Under Matter, we did some, uh, we did some holiday episodes, and there was a theme that I noticed, and I, 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 dug in, I didn't do a huge amount of research, but even just a little bit, you can kind of see this pattern where, Halloween seemed to be this time where it was like acknowledging that things were about to start getting rougher right. and winter is coming yeah. and things are going to start getting more scarce and, you know, making offerings and things like that to, you know, yeah. the spirits and stuff for that. And then you have uh, winter solstice, which uh, same sort of uh, a lot of times it was kind of correlated with the time where it was the cost of feeding livestock sort of, uh, you know, there, there was a diminishing returns yeah. and it was kind of a really good time to just slaughter a bunch of the livestock. And so they would have the big feast at that time. And it was also seemingly just kind of a break yeah. for people in the, the very worst of things. And then even, even St. Patrick's day, and then, uh, had a, a little with Lent and everything of like, this is the final stretch yeah. sort of situation. Yeah. And then, and then you have Easter, where it's like, oh, rebirth, life is coming yeah. back, and we're we're detached from that because we have we can feed everyone with two percent of of That's people right. making yeah. food and everything. But that was really steeped in in, in tradition. And mm -hmm. it, it, did do you have you seen patterns like seasonal patterns with festivities? So. Yeah, that's all of that is absolutely true, but it's true outside of the tropics. Mm -hmm. If you live on the equator, which is where we do our work with the Hadza, that's where they are, um, you don't have seasons like that. You have rainy season and dry season, and there's two a year of each. Uh, and so they do different things in different times, <clears throat> and their diets will shift as things are ripe or not, or um, they eat more, they actually like they eat more meat not intentionally, but they end up eating more meat in the dry season because the animals come to the watering holes and that's, you can find them, right? It's easier to get them. So there are changes like that, but they, it's, it's it, interesting. I think one of the reasons they don't have a big calendar that they follow, not an annual calendar like that, it's more of a moon phase calendar uh, to the extent they have a calendar at all, is that, ah, you know, if it's December or if it's June, it's kind of the same deal, you know? Uh, and so it's another one of these kind of expanding your mind and thinking about it growing up in northern Pennsylvania where it's, there's a real winter and a real summer, uh, thinking about what it's like to be in a world that's not like that. It's kind of eye-opening. All right, we, we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious about the question watching uh, Jurassic 5. Um, what does Swahili word for fuck yeah? <laughs> uh, Nubea. That's the Hadza word for it. Nubea. Uh, Nubea. Nubea. Nice. Yeah, they're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to tell one other funny story. We watched, we also watched, they also like watching like uh, Natural Geographic kind of animal stuff because they love, I mean, they, it's the world they live in. They love it. Uh, and they like watching, they always root for the lions because they are, they view themselves as they are the top predator, right? So, you know, we see the lions kill the antelope and they were like a little single tear. Uh, and they're like, eat that fucking thing. <laughs> they love it. Uh, and and they hate they hate elephants. Uh, they and so if you watch, there was a war, a planet Earth once where the you ever, you ever see the planet Earth where the it's at night and the lions eat the baby elephants, and the Hadza are so happy watching that they couldn't they, but the, in the same one they had uh, walruses, and the, these guys have never seen snow, much less the Arctic, much less an ocean, and they were like, is this like Jurassic Park? Is this the, are the walruses with like the big things? And I'm like, it's like an ele it's like a hippopotamus with elephant teeth, but like with fish hands and arms. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you're fucking with me. That's not <laughs> that is not true. Why do they hate elephants? It's the only thing they're scared of. Uh. The only thing because they can't kill them. And elephants, when they're angry, will kill people. I mean, it's really rare. And I love elephants. And I, I don't want anything to. I, mean, I wish there were more. All those things. But it is absolutely true that an elephant that doesn't like you yeah, can definitely kill you. Yeah, I was wondering, since they don't have a concept of age, really, how they handle the transition Yeah. So they there isn't a big rite of passage at puberty. The big uh, event that happens is you get married. That's kind of like the big adulthood thing. Um, and, you know, obviously that doesn't, they don't have arranged marriages. 
nobody wants to get married and nobody gets married until they want to, which de facto means that nobody gets married until they've gone through puberty, right? Uh, so that's that's how that works. Yeah. What about their mind altering substances? What do they do? They smoke pot. Um, they don't grow it, so they have to trade for it. And and actually, then that's that's fine. And then there's also there's alcohol that they can get in the villages, and that becomes more of a problem because uh, they have you know the, the, like a lot of cultures everywhere, like America, uh, there's issues with alcoholism uh, in 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 some pockets, which is sad. Uh, but uh, the main one historically has been they they smoke they like to smoke, so they they will you know tobacco as well, but they'll also smoke marijuana. Because uh, you mentioned malaria and, and um, nicotine's uh, insecticide, right? Uh, could you... Is that? I mean, I'm sure it, it's toxic. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I think that's why so plants have nicotine, right, is to kill bugs. So maybe. Smokers uh, get bit less in, in, in typically areas where there's like higher, higher um, malaria rates, has a higher percentage, sometimes up to 100% of men smoke yeah. in the areas where there's the most amount of huh. mosquitoes around. I've learned something today. Yay! Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, one more. How you said there's two seasons, and so fetal development during that time, does it make a difference if during conception there was a dry season, and then, you know, then, oh, yeah. does that make a difference? That's a wonderful question. Uh, that if, if you are, if a woman is pregnant in the dry season versus the wet season, does that affect her to the child? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We 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 see we see instances of that in other cultures where there's been studied better with you know with only a few hundred people. That sounds like a lot, but it's not. And so, do you get big samples to ask that question? I think we'd need to look somewhere else. But uh, I also work in northern Kenya with a group there, a larger group that's a pastoralist group. They they live on their herds of goats and camels and and uh, cattle. And we do see some evidence there that kids born in the rainy season or the wet season uh, seem to have slightly different kind of their bodies handle water and thirst a little bit differently, which is interesting. Um, whether there's really something there, we're, we're still drilling down on that. But maybe, yeah. You would, you wouldn't, it, you, we should expect that, right? We're long-lived, and so the, the information we get as children from our environment should tell us how we want to grow up. Our, uh, yeah. most, most things have mating season. Is there, is there any time of year where just like more more kids are being born? No, usual. it's, uh, you know, humans are, uh, and actually other apes too, we, we you know, sex happens all the time. And so you end up having kids all the time. There's not, you don't see that too much. And they're never, you know, it's not like there's periods where they're starving. If, you, if there were periods where they were starving, then that would affect women's physiology. They wouldn't cycle as often, or, or the, you know, the cycles might not be as healthy. And so they might have fewer kids be, just because of the food availability. But that's, in the Hadza camp, there's always food. So you heard it from a Duke professor. It would be perfectly natural for us to break into an orgy at any point today. Thank you guys so much for coming out. But here we are. Thank you, Herman Ponser. Thank you. I appreciate it.